Awesome, awesome. Oh, it's good. It is good. We're going to pray because that's what this morning's about. Father, thank you again for this morning, Lord. You are just amazing. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence just falling in this place. Lord, thank you that you're stirring our hearts, that you're causing us to be awake, Lord, that you're breaking off stupor and sleep, and you're causing us to be alive and awake. Lord, thank you that you've called us for this time in this season to be in this place at this hour. Father, thank you that you are filled with intention and purpose, and I thank you that you help us grasp and grasp what that is, that you show us what you've called us to do, Lord, that you've shown us how to walk with you and how to commune with you. Father, I thank you for the tools you've given us to see your will accomplished on the earth. We just worship you, Father. We give you this morning, and God, I put all my confidence in you this morning. Without your grace, I will put everyone to sleep. But Father, I thank you that by your grace, it can bring, be, you can breathe on your word and you can bring it to life for us and bring us a, a word in this hour that we need from your Holy Spirit. So I just receive your grace and I acknowledge in front of everyone, oh God, that apart from you, I don't have anything. I have nothing apart from you. Oh, but God, in you, I have you. <laughs> and you are everything. So Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your gentleness towards us. Thank you that you are over, overflowing with the fruit of the Spirit towards us so that we can also abound in it towards one another. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, it's going to be a good morning. I'm excited this morning. I'm excited most mornings. But I, I, I was... So yesterday, I thought I was going to have the house to myself. And I was really... I was really excited. You might not know it, but I'm actually much more introverted than I am extroverted. <laughs> I love to be alone because I'm, I love to be alone with the Lord. And, uh, you know, life is busier these days and I need to guard that. And I do guard that. Um, but I was looking forward to Saturday because I was going to have this day to be with the Lord. And I was excited because everyone was leaving. My whole house was, I love my family, but they were leaving. And it was... <laughs> And it was good because I was excited to be with the Lord. And then my roommate didn't leave and he invited a bunch of people over <laughs> and they were very lively. And so on Friday, I went pheasant hunting with my family and we got some pheasants and it was, it was great. It was fun. We had, a great, we had a great time. But I had these, a row of dead pheasants in my backyard that I need to get to taken care of. And um, uh, my roommate thought it'd be really funny to grab one of those dead birds and start chasing his friends around with it throughout the house. <laughs> so I have videos that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to show you next week because you have to see it to uh, appreciate it. But all I, I'm trying to read the word and I just hear this, wah, wah, this screaming as this man goes flying out my back door in his socks and then down the road. It was, and Emmanuel's chasing him with the dead pheasant flapping in the wind. Oh man, it was like, oh Lord. Okay. <laughs> but then they left too. And I did get my time with the Lord last night. It was like we had a date night. And oh man, it was so good. I just got to, you know, the nice thing about where we live is that we have a little, we got a decent amount of space in between us and the other houses. So I just got to, I just get to let it rip in my house. I just yell and scream at the top of my lungs and I get excited. <laughs> and I just have an amazing time with the Lord and I get on my face and I'm also quiet. And I just, got to love on him last night and then he just came to love on me it's like one of those things where it's just like you just want to you just want to let god you just want to let uh, like love on god and let him love on you but he just can't help but begin to pour his love back he's so good and so i got pretty excited last night and i was just like oh father let me never forget this that this is what it's all about it's about connecting with you and get, making time for you. And I tell you, I got more life from that moment than I, did, I do from anything that this world has to offer. He, he, his presence just comes and his perspective begins to line up with yours and you begin to see different and he starts to change things and the weight of the world begins to fall off and it melt, melts like wax in his presence and then you just get your heart renewed and your mind changed and it's just this beautiful place of communion and that's what prayer is, which we're going to talk about this morning. Prayer, there are many different kinds of prayers, but I want to just, I, I really want to make this simple this morning. I have some things that we need to go through in order to, for us to understand. So there's going to be some things that are fairly basic this morning, but it's a good place to start. But 
before I get into uh, what I want to show you, I just want to say that prayer is connecting your heart with the Lord's. It is not a method. It's not a formula. It's not a repeat after me. It's not you trying to say the right thing to impress him. Are you saying the right thing so that, oh, maybe he'll hear me if I get the right orders and the right scriptures in order? No, it's your heart before the Lord. And it's you crying out to him where you are at. And it can be ugly too. Oh, I've cried out to God and it was not pretty. It was not pretty, but I was being raw and real and authentic. You read the Psalms and you see the rawness of David's heart when he's crying out to God. That's prayer. That's communion. You see the heart of David when he's just overflowing and abounding in thanksgiving. And he's just, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You are with me. You have subdued my enemies. You have delivered my soul from death. You've kept my feet from falling. You've delivered my eyes from tears. Oh, I worship you. That's thanksgiving. There's adoration where it's just like, Father, I, you are all that impresses me. You are holy and wonderful and worthy and greatly and great to be praised. God, I worship you. You are awesome. You are so impressive, God. You form the heavens and the earth and all that is within them. And when I look at you, I just can't help but be in awe. When I behold the stars of the sky and I see the wonders of your hands, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you consider him? God, you are awesome. There's these prayers of adoration where you're just, it's an expression of your heart. It's not you trying to, it's coming out of an overflow of your heart being connected to his. Does this make sense? It's prayer. It's not just, Lord, thank you for my wife. Thank you for my day. Thank you for my job. Amen. That's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but we must go much deeper than that. We must go much deeper than that. And so I want to encourage you this morning, friends, that, that prayer is, a, is an absolute crucial part of the believer's journey in God, not just for themselves, but for the church they're a part of, for the city that they're a part of, for the nation that they're a part of, and for what God has called them to do on the earth. Prayer is the key that unites heaven and earth. And so I'm going to go through some of that this morning and show you just how important it is. But we have to lay a couple things down in our understanding first. And so I'm going to see if this thing, yeah, there we go. So I'll just wait a minute for that to come on. But biblically, we see, we see prayers for everything. There's not really anything in, in the, in, throughout the word of God that we don't see prayers for. And so, uh, oh, there it is. There we go. So in the word, we see prayers for nations and cities. We see prayer that are in regards to nature, storms, droughts, earthquakes, volcanoes. We see personal prayer, prayer for family, church, business, politics, society. Yes, everything. We bring everything before the Lord. Where there's, there's prayers of intercession where we're lifting up nations and we're lifting up churches where we're lifting up individuals and we're contending and we're fighting and we're declaring things over their life. I do it with my family all the time. I do it for this church. I do it for myself. I'm like, Father, I pray, I pray, Lord, for my son that you would fill his heart with faith. God, I'm fighting for his belief system, Lord. I pray that your light would come upon him, that you would cast out any darkness, that you would renew a right spirit within him. God, I pray that you would give him clean hands and a pure heart. Father, I pray that he would walk in the purpose for which you created him, that he would know you and that he would love you with all of his heart and all of his soul and all of his mind and all of his strength. Oh God, that he might know you and serve you all the days of his life. I pray for my son, I contend for him, and I contend for you. <laughs> These are the prayers of intercession. These are prayers that God wants us to pray where we come before him. And there's been times where I've been feeling weak and I've been feeling like, God, I feel like what I'm seeing with my eyes is beginning to impact what I believe with my heart and I need your help. God, would you form faith in me? Faith is a fruit of your spirit and I need your faith, not faith, not my mustered up faith, but your faith. For, so for this situation, would you give me faith, Lord, so I can pray according to your will by your spirit and with absolute confidence? He'll do it. Oh, he will. So why is prayer so important? I'm going to show you a few verses where you might be thinking, okay, you just asked why is prayer important? And now you're reading these scriptures. I don't understand. I will explain. But this is very important for us to have a, a, a foundational understanding of why prayer is so important. This is the first verse I'll show you. This is from Genesis 2. This is the history of the heavens. Notice it's plural. 
and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made earth and the heavens, heavens, not he made earth and the heaven, earth and the heavens, it's plural. Nehemiah 9, 6, you alone are Lord, you made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, the host of heaven worships you. The host of heaven worships you. And so we see that there's a plural heavens. Did you guys know that there are at least three heavens? Did you know that? There's at least three. And it's very important to understand. This is a picture of them right here. The first heaven is our atmosphere. The second heaven is like our solar system, the starry sky. And the third heaven is, the where, is where the Lord lives, where the, the dwelling of God is, if you will. And we actually see here in the word that Lucifer in Isaiah made such a ridiculous statement. This is what got him kicked out of heaven. He was lifted up in pride and he was like, I'm gonna be God over all of the heavens. That's my plan. This is Lucifer speaking in Isaiah 14. He says, I will ascend into heaven in general. Then I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's the second heaven. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. That's the third heaven. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. That's the first heaven. And I will be like the most high. Paul says something interesting. He says in 2 Corinthians, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven, to the third heaven. That's where God's dwelling is. Paul was actually caught up. We see that all throughout scripture, people getting caught up. So Paul gets caught up into the third heaven. And so the second heaven is where uh, the, the principalities, powers, mights, and dominions and thrones are basically set up. And so there are over geographical locations and, and you have to keep in mind that for every one that fell, there's two others that have not. There are good principalities, powers, mights, dominions, and thrones. In fact, they outnumber the bad ones. For example, Michael, it says in the word, is the prince of, of Israel. He is a principality over Israel. It's important to know. There are other principalities that are obviously very bad and they're over geographical locations because they have permission to be there. Why do they have permission to be there? That's what we're gonna get into a little bit. So God says something interesting here. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image. You've heard this verse many times. According to our likeness, let them have dominion, which is to reign and be ruler over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Dominion. And then the next verse in Psalm 115, 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Wow, interesting. So the earth actually belongs to us. God has given us the earth and it's something that we're called to steward, not just physically, but also spiritually. And so because God has given us these things and he says, I have given you dominion over the earth. Just like there are natural laws, there are also spiritual laws and God will not violate them. And so God has given the earth to us and he looks for someone who will stand in the gap to intercede and say, hey, father, I'm crying out to you. I see injustice over here. Would you stretch out your hand and do something because this is wrong? God, would you give us justice? And you begin to partner with him, which enables him to act upon the earth because it's your responsibility to do that because you've been given the earth and you are to have dominion over it. And the best way to have dominion over it is by asking God to come and do it through you. That's why we're the body of Christ, the embodiment of Christ. So God is waiting and he's looking for those who through prayer will agree with him to see just like Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. We are going to take an entire Sunday to, to dissect, if you will, and really look at the Lord's prayer because there's a lot of lack of understanding around it. And it's kind of got to be a religious thing that we just kind of quote when we don't know what else to say. And we're, so we're gonna, it's, it's not just, it's not just, he's showing us a, a way. It's not just to repeat this every time. He's actually giving us a, not a formula, but understanding so that we can know how to pray. So we're gonna go through that in great detail. It's very important. 
But our participation with the Lord on the planet is massive in order to see his hand move upon the earth. Now, there are some things in God's sovereignty that he will just do. But there are more, I would say there's a lot more that he cannot do until there's a human agent who agrees with him to see it accomplished on the earth. We'll see this biblically in a minute. But there's a story I wanted to share real quick of a man named Bobby Connor. Very interesting man. And uh, he was down in the, it was, he lives in the States and he was down in Tennessee, which is in the kind of the southwestern or southeastern, sorry, part of America many years ago. I think it was in the late nineties, or early thousands. And he was, he's an itinerant minister and he was driving somewhere. And at the time in, in the northwestern part of the States, in Montana, California, and, and somewhere else, there were at least 98 wildfires burning. And they were spending $1.4 million a day trying to get these wildfires under control. And so Bobby is at this thing and he's, he's about to catch a plane. He's about to go somewhere else. And he's, none of this is on his radar. He knows about it, of course, because it was making a lot of headlines. There's, the fires were incredibly devastating. And he's going to get on a plane and the Lord spoke to him and he said, Bobby, there's fires burning in the Northwest. What are you gonna do about it? And he said, what? He goes, I didn't know I was responsible. <laughs> and the Lord said, if not you, then who? And he quoted Psalm 115, the heavens, even the heavens are mine, but the earth I have given to the children of men. There's fires burning, Bobby. What are you gonna do about it? That's your problem. You're supposed to represent me on the earth and I'm waiting to act, but I need you to come into agreement with me because of the spiritual law that I've given you the earth. And I'm looking for an intercessor, someone who will stand in the gap. And so Bobby, the Lord has spoken to him. Now he has plans, he has a life, he has somewhere he's supposed to be, but God has spoken. You drop everything when he speaks. And so he said, Father, what do you want me to do? Because he didn't know what to do. So he's a wise man. He asked the Lord, what do I do, Lord? And the Lord said, I want you to go to the Northwest and stand on this mountain and prophesy a snowstorm and I'll put out the fires. This was in the, this was in the middle of August, a snowstorm. That's when you really know it's the Lord because it's completely impossible. So he's on, he's, he's like, okay, Lord, all right, I'll do it. And so he got another pastor. He flew to the closest city that he could that was by the fires. And then from there, they took a car and they went to the mountain. There's some really crazy stuff that happened in between that confirmed it was the Lord speaking to him. I won't get into it for the sake of time, but he gets to the mountain and they stand on the mountain, him and this pastor, and they just prophesy a snowstorm. They prophesy what God had told them to prophesy. Very simple. It was what God told them to do. The next morning, that night, the winds blew in. The snow began to fall. I kid you not, you can see it. It's, it's on the pa paper in Mos Mis Mussolini? No, not Mussolini. <laughs> Mis Misala, Montana. I tried to pronounce it. I was like, Lord, don't let me say Mussolini. And I did it. And I did it. I said it. Oh, see, we need to be more connected. Musala, Musala. Musala, Montana, I'm still probably saying it wrong. Anyway, the newspaper came out and it said, snowstorm, surprise snowstorm, fire extinguished. And the, on the front page is a picture of the fireman walking off the mountain. And God sent a snowstorm and he put out the fires because a man agreed with him on behalf of what God wanted to do and just wasn't like, oh man, there's fires burning there. That's too bad. Hope those firefighters can get it put out. No, God's looking for his church to rise up on matters of the earth and cry out to him. No wonder God said, my house will be called a house of prayer. If it's not, we're not gonna get anything done. <laughs> we're just not. Oh, God is good. So I wanna just show you through the word where we see some things where, where God, there's actually some startling verses and I wanna go through them with you real quick. This is the Lord speaking. He says, yes, truth is missing. And he who turns away from evil makes himself pray. That means the one who's turning away from evil, it's not going well for him because of the state of the culture. Now the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and was amazed that there was no one to intercede. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation and his own righteousness sustained him. You know, it, our English is so polite. And he was amazed that there was no intercessor. The word amazed in the Hebrew is actually shamaim, and it means to be stunned in such a way that it causes one to be horrified and appalled. It means to be left in astonishment. This is the Lord. 
his, he's got a lot of self-control. <laughs> his emotions are under wrap. So when we see that God is astonished at something, that he's appalled, we should pay attention to that. He's like, what is going, look at these evil things that are happening on the earth. And I looked for someone who would intercede. Where's, where are my people? Are they, they're, they're so caught up in their own worlds that they don't even cry out to me. And yet this cry has come up to heaven and I'm looking for someone to agree with me so I can act on behalf of the earth. I've given the earth to the children of men. Ezekiel 22, we see a similar thing. The people of the land have practiced oppression and extortion and have committed robbery. They have wronged the poor and the needy and have oppressed the stranger without justice. And here the Lord says again, so I searched for a man among them who would build up a wall and stand in the gap before me for the sake of the land that I would not destroy it. But I found no one, not even one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have repaid their way by bringing it upon their own heads, says the Lord God. Do you see how the Lord God, again, he's, he's looking for someone who will intercede and cry out for mercy. God didn't want to destroy the land. That actually wasn't his will. He wanted to bring about mercy. He was looking for somebody, anybody to stand in the gap on behalf of man and cry out to him so that he wouldn't have to do this because you have to remember that God is a God of justice. Psalm 89, 14, his throne is founded on justice and righteousness. If he didn't act in justice, his throne would topple. That's what his throne is founded upon. And so God looks for justice and he wants to bring it, but he wants to bring it through the agent of mercy by finding someone who will cry out, kind of like Jesus' his entire life was. <laughs> he became the man who stood in the gap for us. But now he says, follow me and do the same. Jesus is the one on the cross saying, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. And he's looking for that in his people as well. And I'm going to touch on this for a minute because I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> I'm going to now. I wasn't planning on it, but I feel like I'm supposed to. Guys, we need to be praying for our government. We need to be praying for our nation. And I'm not talking praying what your own will. I'm talking about seeking the Lord and seeing that there's things going on that, Father, we need you. We don't need a, a better government. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Of course, government matters, but we need to have what matters most. Well, the primary thing on our hearts, which is contending and crying out for God, that the gospel comes to Canada, that the truth is poured out in Canada, that love is in Canada, and that mercy comes and triumphs over the judgment we all deserve. We need to be praying for Justin Trudeau. And I have to, oh man, I gotta, I'm gonna get feisty. I gotta say it. I got to say it, it is absolutely wrong for anyone in this room to speak in a way that is evil of Justin Trudeau. It is wrong. The Bible says to speak evil of no one and make intercessions for all men, including the king. It's in your Bible. It's not my opinion, but it forms my opinion because it's his truth. We are to be contending. I'm praying, Father, would you pour out your spirit on Justin Trudeau? Would you have mercy on his household? Would you bring salvation to his heart, God? Would you show them the way that he ought to go? Would you show them the reason that you called him to this position? Father, no authority comes except by that which you give it. Would you cause him to walk in the reason that you gave it to him for? Have mercy on him, Lord. Reveal yourself to him, God. Show him who you are and give him a boldness to follow the spirit and not be afraid of men. God, would you show him who you are? And you intercede for your leader and you cry out from a place that's in agreement with God's heart. Otherwise, you're praying your own will. That's very dangerous. That's a soulish prayer. So we need to, we need to, well, I'm going to get into that. Okay, I'm going to get into that. But it's just important, people. It's very important because we see this, this famous verse we quote all the time, but it's the truth that we need to understand. If my people, my people, if my church who is called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Seek my face. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. See how we cannot do that and his ear might not be as attentive? There's a lot of things in the word where we see the Lord say, if you do this, I will do that. 
if you will do this, I will do that. If you will partner with me in my spirit and as owners of the earth, give me a place to come and land so that I can do what I want to do, I will come do it. I will do it. And so it's important that we see our responsibility goes way beyond just praying for blessing, protection in our family or loved ones. That stuff is good. We should be doing it. But there's way more than that. There's way more than that. And so that's what I want to invite you into this morning, friends, is what God is calling us into in prayer. And there's intercessions and even just honestly, the simplicity of communing with him. And taking the time, like I, I, guys, I pray, you know, in the word, in the New Testament and the old, we don't find anyone praying when it, when we're given time frames, when it's, when it's something that's consistent, we don't see any less than twice a day in the morning and at night. Now the word also says pray without ceasing. <laughs> so there's always this awareness of our communion with the Lord, but it's important too that we just take the time to receive truths in the word where I'm not just reading it, but I stop and I was like, wow, this is personal. I'm going to receive that. Wow, God, I, I, I see that I'm accepted in the beloved. I see that I'm accepted by you. I see that your inheritance is in the saints. Your inheritance is in me? I'm your inheritance? Wow, you must think pretty highly of me. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. You sent your son for me. You didn't just deal with my sin, but you revealed my value. Father, it says in your word that I can receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness to reign in this life like a king. God, I receive that, what you, what you have for me today. I receive your righteousness today. Father, I thank you that you love me. And I receive the grace that you are giving me today to walk in all that you've called me to do. That I lack no good thing as it's your good pleasure to give me your kingdom. I thank you that I'm in you. I thank you that you reveal yourself to me more. I thank you that you give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. I thank you that you reveal yourself to me and you continually show me who I am in you and who you are in me. God, I worship you. You're amazing. I love you. You're so filled with mercy and grace. I want to be like you. Show me how. Father, would you show me how? There's other times where I'm just going, I was like, well, God, today was a little crazy, hey? <laughs> today was a crazy day, Lord. That thing that happened there kind of stressed me out. I think we need to talk about it. Can I talk to you about it? And I talk to him about it. And, he, I, and I speak with him like I would my wife or a friend. And it's prayer and it's communion and it's my heart before the Lord. See how it's all of these things? It's this communion with the Lord. So what I want to go through very quickly is what prayer is not. And there's just three points. But this is what prayer is not. We've got to keep our hearts safe from this. Prayer is not begging God to do something that he does not want to do. That's not prayer. James 4 says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Again, we're getting back to the motive, right? We're getting back to the motive. Why are, why are we praying? What, what is the motive of our heart before the Lord? Do I want to treat him like a genie in a bottle where he just gives me what I want or Santa Claus and I get my list and God, would you do this for me? And when you do, great, thanks. And I go on with my life. No, it's way more than that. He's not a genie in a bottle. He's our father. He's the maker of heaven and earth. We miss the mark when we ask from our point of view and don't take the time to know God's point of view and will for what we are praying for. So we need to do that, friends. You know, the word says in Colossians that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. God wants you filled with the knowledge of his will. It says in Ephesians 5 that we would not be unwise, but wise and understand the will of the Lord. And that's really encouraging because James 1 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And he'll give it to you. You want to know his will? Ask for wisdom. Ask him to fill you with the knowledge of his will. He wants you to know. And so before I pray, I, I'm very careful, guys. We cannot just pray our own opinions or our own will. We've got to be careful. We need to yield those things to the Lord. And we need to be praying and asking God, Lord, would you reveal your will to me so I can come into agreement with what you're doing and I can pray in alignment with you. And that is where we'll see so much prayer answered. Oh, man. It's his delight then. Second thing, prayer is not. Prayer is not asking God to do something just once. That's not what prayer is. Sometimes it might just take once, but it's, that's not the concept. In Matthew 7, 7, it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. What's interesting is in the Greek, the idea here is actually that of a battering ram where you're constantly knocking at the door. It's almost like it, it's almost like it would be saying, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. 
There's a consistency, and we see this as a, as a truth throughout the word. We see Matthew 18, where Jesus gives the parable of the widow who comes before the unrighteous judge and asks again and again and again, and it said that judge didn't fear God nor regard man. But because of her persistence, he said, lest she weary me to death, I'll do what she's saying. And the Lord says, that's an unjust judge who does not fear God nor regard man. And yet they answered that one because of their persistence. How much more were our gracious and kind and loving and good heavenly father ask when we keep on knocking and keep on seeking and keep on requesting and we don't give up. There are people I have been praying for for 17 years for their salvation. And they seem farther now than they were when I started praying. And what does that have to do with truth? or my consistent persistence. <laughs> I will keep praying and I will keep lifting them up and by my God, they will get saved. They will. I am not letting time affect my heart or my faith. I'm going before the Lord and I know it's his will. It says in the word that his will is that not one should perish. Did you know that the will of God is not being accomplished on the earth all the time? Did you know that? It's not. If it was, all would be saved right? There's people dying. There's disease. There's famine. There's pestilence. There's people that are going to hell and God doesn't want that. And so it's not, his will is not always happening. Life and death are in the power of your tongue, by the way. Isn't that intense? I don't think we understand the authority that God's given us and the way that he's called us to steward our walk with him as he's given us this earth and everything that's on it. We need to steward that. We need to fear him in it and we need to grow in our understanding of it. Because friends, the exciting thing is we have so much authority. When we partner with God and his will, we have so much. And so there are people that, that God is desiring that again, not one be lost. And so he's looking, he's looking for an intercessor. Who will pray for this person? Who will bring the gospel to this person? Who will lift up this person? But when we get so caught up in our own little lives and we forget why we're here, we leave God in a place where he wonders that there's no intercessor. He wonders where his people are. And it's important because we don't understand what's at stake here, guys. We don't, people's eternal salvation, where they're going to be forever is at stake. What God wants to do on the earth, he wants his will to be fulfilled. He wants to touch Canada. Oh, he wants to come through. He does. He wants the gospel to come and the glory to spread from sea to shining sea. But will he find his people who agree with him and continue to agree with him? So please don't hear me wrong. This isn't some heavy handed thing I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm passionate because I'm trying to express how much it matters. It matters so much that we understand this and we see beyond ourselves and yes, our own families. Amen. We need to see the greater thing that God wants to do where he wants to bring his kingdom to the earth. He wants to bring it to Canada. He wants to bring it to Calgary. Oh, he does. Last thing, prayer is not to be thought of as wearing God down in an effort to get him to act. That's not what we're trying to do. That's what the widow was doing with the unjust judge. She's just trying to wear him down. I'm going to keep coming, wear him down, wear him down, wear him down. This is different. This is no, Lord, I'm just going to come and commune my heart with you. And I know that you hear me and I'll keep coming again and again and again. Jesus prayed for a blind man twice. That's Jesus. The first time he prayed, he saw men walking like trees. The second time he prayed, he could totally see. That's Jesus. We might have to pray a couple times. Matthew 6, 7, and when you pray, this is Jesus, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. That's what they do, right? It's not, God's not looking for you to, like, he's not impressed by how long your prayer is. He's impressed by how sincere your heart is. That's what touches God. How sincere are you? Are you just playing religion? Are you just playing like, I, well, I know I need to pray, so I'm just gonna, no, it's like, God, okay, religion, back off. <laughs> Jesus, come in. Show me, Lord, how can I commune with you right now? How can I pray? Sometimes I gotta be, I gotta sit and be quiet and just let his spirit mold and, and just affect my emotions because I got touched by the world for a little too long. And my mind starts to go and I need him to help me, but it's not through vain repetitions. It's from a part of sincerity. I have two more slides and then I, the last two is kind of where I want to camp for the rest of the morning. Oh, we're doing good. I think we're doing good. Okay. Why is it difficult to pray? 
Why is it difficult to pray? We need to touch on it. Number one is separation. Feeling separated from the Lord. It is very difficult for us to pray for ourselves or others when we don't feel close enough to the Father for our prayers to make a difference. You might have thoughts like this. I don't feel close to God right now, so my prayer won't do any good. Separation can make it difficult to pray. Feeling separated from the Lord, like you're not clean enough, you're not good enough. And the funny thing is, it's very simple to take care of that. Just go to him and get clean. <laughs> if you got some stuff in your life, go to him. You can't get clean apart from him. He doesn't want you to feel separate. He wants you to be close. But that feeling can be something that affects us and does, makes us not want to pray. But ask him to draw, to draw you after him. The second is a lack of faith and unbelief. Those who do not believe do not pray. It's just true. Those who do not believe do not pray. You will think God won't or can't answer my prayer. And that's again, guys, all of this gets solved with, <laughs> the funny thing is it all gets solved with prayer and communion with the Lord. Father, would you forgive me for any and everything in my heart that is in alignment with unbelief? And would you drop faith into my spirit and cause me to pray from a place of faith? Not my own faith, but your faith. Three, pride and self-sufficiency. A prideful person rarely thinks to ask God for help. When things are not going well, you just put your head down and you try to force change by sheer willpower. A prideful person doesn't even really see the need for God to help. You got this. You got this. <laughs> Oh, we need him. We need him way more than we understand. That's the problem with when Jesus wrote that letter to the Laodiceans. He says, you think you are wealthy. You think you are rich and you have need of nothing. You think you are this one way, but you don't understand that spiritually, when you look at the condition of this church, the Laodicea, it was blind, naked, and wretched. And God's like, you think you don't need me. And so there's a deception there. But when we see our need for him, oh, it changes everything. And we humble ourselves and grace comes on the humble. Busyness is another one. Busyness. You may think something like this. I have too much going on right now to stop and pray. Life is just too busy. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to pray. Well, friends, then I would suggest you greatly shift your priorities because that's just out of whack. <laughs> Do not be too busy to pray. If you're too busy to pray, you are too busy and you need to change something and you have complete control over your life. You can get up earlier, you can stay up later. You can take things out of your life that you're doing that God maybe not hasn't asked you to do. I'm just saying you can seek him and show him, Lord, show me what is in my life right now that I am to be doing and show me if there's anything in my life that I'm not supposed to be doing right now. This is a big one, number six, disappointments, bitterness. You don't have understanding into why some of your past prayers have not been answered, so you might make up your own theology about it and cease to pray for such things again. Somewhere in your faith walk, disappointment crept in and keeps you from pressing into the Lord again. Guys, this is like me and my wife. This September, we'll be trying to have kids for 11 years. 11 years, and the Lord spoke to us and said that we would have kids. You guys know this, I've shared it many times, but this is just a good example. I am not letting disappointment in that not happening to creep into my walk with God because he matters more than anything to me. He matters more than all the children he could ever give me. My relationship with him is what matters more. I love him more. And so why would I let something that is on the earth affect my walk with him? No, I'm not gonna get disappointed. I love him more. And so, yes, Lord, I am absolutely believing that you have children for us. You have more children for us. And I love you, Lord. It's so kind of you that you would speak that to me. And the journey has been long, but I refuse to give in to disobedience and bitterness and unbelief. I choose to stand and believe by my God will still see children. And I am not discouraged and I'm not disappointed. And even if they never came, I'll go to the grave saying, blessed be the name of the Lord but I will die believing. <laughs> and stubbornness can be good, yielded by his spirit. But I'm just saying, friends, disappointment and bitterness is real. There's some things that we've contended for and all prayed for, but don't let that become what influences your belief system. Let faith and the word of God influence the, your belief system and don't grow weary in the well-doing. You know, Jesus said, when he, but right before he gave the parable of the widow, he said, and Jesus said a parable to them that they always ought to pray and not lose heart. Have you guys struggled losing heart? Has that been hard? I know it's been hard. It's been a hard couple of years. 
But Jesus equates prayer to not losing heart. That we're communing with him. We're bringing our life and our heart to him. And from that place, we can live where we don't lose heart. It's prayer. It's communion with the Lord. And it's a dialogue, not a monologue. Seven, not knowing what or how to pray. This is one of the other things that hinders us from praying or, or finding it difficult to pray. You might think, I don't know how or what to pray, so I'll let someone else do it. Or I don't feel qualified to pray. Or other people's prayers seem more spiritual than mine, so I'm embarrassed to pray my simple prayer. You guys ever think that? You guys ever been with somebody that's like, man, that they know how to pray. Oh gosh, like that was just like, oh, that was a good prayer. I don't have... Uh, one like that. <laughs> I don't have a prayer that fancy. Mine's pretty simple. I think I'll be quiet. It's like, no, no, God wants to hear your simple prayer. And that simple prayer might do way more than the person's fancy prayer. God's looking at the heart. It's like the, when he saw the Pharisee that was giving, let's say, thousands of dollars into the offering. And then there's the poor woman comes and she gives two pennies. And He's so moved by the woman who gave two pennies because she gave out of her lack and out of, that was all that she had and yet it was just two pennies and the Pharisee gave out of his abundance and thousands of dollars and God could care less about the thousands of dollars because the heart it came from. He was so impressed with the two pennies because it was her whole heart before the Lord. I give you everything, God. That impressed the Lord. And it's a similar principle we see in prayer. It's authentic and it's simple and it matters. Your prayers matter, all of them, all of them. And you are qualified to pray. It's kind of like, you know, it's a funny thing what it talks about in the word about the, the husband and the wife and it's like the Jesus and the bride of Christ and all of these things. It'd be kind of like me saying, I don't feel qualified to talk to my wife. <laughs> Isn't that a weird, weird, weird thought? That's how it can be when we think about not feeling qualified to pray. You don't feel qualified to talk to the Lord? You're so qualified. You're so qualified. Last one, I'm going to end on this, guys. How can we make prayer easier? How can we make prayer easier? Number one, you listened to Jocelyn's sermon last Sunday. That's one way to make prayer easier. You get into worship and praise. You fill your heart and your mind with the word of God. And you spend time in thanksgiving, praise, and worship. You know what it says? We enter into his gates with thanksgiving. These aren't metaphors, guys. This is real. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We just get through the door, thanksgiving. And then we get a little deeper into the courts through what? Praise, praise. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. When you get alone, when you're in your vehicle, pray and begin to thank the Lord. Begin to just offer up thanks to him. It could start off in the simplest of things, but you thank him. And then you begin to praise him and worship him and just fix your eyes on him. Play a song that really connects your heart in this season. Find something and connect with him and get God's perspective and fill your heart with truth. The other one is pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. Pray in tongues. There's been times where I haven't known what to pray. And so I'll just spend time just praying in tongues by myself. And then it's like understanding eventually just comes. And it's beautiful. So pray in the spirit. Number three, ask what would God give? What would give God the most glory in this situation? If you don't know what to pray, just think about it and say, Holy Spirit, help me. What would give God the most glory in this situation and pray accordingly? It helps us. Four, practice and consistency. It's like anything else. The more you do it, the more comfortable you'll get with it, the better at it you will get. Continually pray. It's like Romans 12, 12. Be joyful in hope, faithful in prayer. Now, what is it, honey? Joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Oh yeah, do that too. And joyful in prayer or consistent in prayer. Yeah, sorry, I watched that one a little bit, guys. <laughs> but it's just saying be faithful in prayer, continually praying that we would have lifestyles. Prayer is like a lifestyle. It goes into your lifestyle, guys. We need to be praying and a people of prayer. And the last is repentance. When we have confidence, we are clean before God, we will pray. We will pray. And so... First John says that if we sin, we have, a, we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ the righteous, who is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. 
So you get with God and you just spend time, just Father, would you forgive me if, you, if there's something in your heart or your conscience isn't clean, bring it to the Lord and get clean. And then you're praying with confidence because you're close to him and that separation is gone. So we need to be a praying people. I'm gonna close with that, guys. We need, to be, we need to be a praying people. And I want to encourage you that it is simple and it's powerful and the Lord is listening to your cry. He is listening to your prayers. And we have been given the stewardship of the earth. And there are things that God has called us to do even as a body. And I wanna, I wanna ask you if I, could, if I could humbly request from you, can you be praying for our local church? Can you be praying for this church? And ask the Lord how to pray. Can you be praying for the church of Calgary? There's stuff coming up. There's actually a fairly big uh, leaders meeting coming up later on this month. God is doing something in Calgary. It's not just here. God is doing something in Calgary and it's a beautiful thing. And I wonder if we would, what it would look like to partner with him and pray and not just be so consumed with our own lives that we miss the kingdom and what God wants to do through us. And yes, through your simple prayer, your simple prayer, you have no idea. It says in, in James that Elijah was a man just like you and me. He had a nature like ours and yet he earnestly prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed earnestly again that it would rain and the rain did come. And so I wanna encourage you guys that we, we have so much that we can do by partnering with the Lord in prayer. We can seriously see change. We can see change. So please pray for our government. Do not do not speak evil of our government, okay? It's not about denial. It's not about not recognizing that there's some serious issues. I'm not saying that. I'm saying be very careful how you talk about someone whose price tag is the blood of Christ. That's the lens in which you should view Justin Trudeau through. I'm going to say it. It's the blood of Christ. Do not speak ill of him. Pray for him. Intercede for him. Ask for mercy. Pray for salvation. Pray that for our conservative leaders too, by the way. Pray it for all of them. The kingdom is not partisan. The kingdom is about humans. <laughs> and we're all lost without him. And so intercede for our nation, please. Intercede for the truckers. Intercede for all of them. Having no bias, no partiality. Intercede with the heart of God because he loves all of them, regardless of what you believe and what you want. Jesus wants the gospel to come to Canada. Could you pray that? Yeah? Could you pray that? Because you have authority to pray that. And God so wants to stoop low to hear your cry and to stretch out his hand to answer your prayer. Yes, he does. You are a child of the living God. You have just as much influence as anyone else that's in the kingdom. And imagine what would it look like if we as a people were to truly become a house of prayer? Oh, think about how just it would be of God to come and act on our behalf because he found a house full of people who pray. Wouldn't that be amazing? And so I just want to encourage you, friends, that let's keep growing in our prayers. Let's keep growing in our intercessions and let's keep growing in our communion with the Lord where you just wake up in the morning and you start the day by saying, Father, thank you that your love for me is available and real today. And whether I can feel it or see it doesn't matter. I know you loved me. You already showed me through the cross and I receive the abundance of grace you have for me today to walk in what you've called me to do today. Thanks for your love. Thanks for your joy. No matter what I face today, I'm not facing it alone because the Lord my God is with me. So it's not a bad day. It's a day full of grace. Cool. All right, my friends. Next week, I would encourage you to be here because we are gonna go through the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, it's funny, I was praying and I was asking the Lord uh, what to do leading up to this. And I had a, something very different I wanted to share. And the Lord really put prayer in my heart. And I think it's a very timely word because of also just all the stuff we see got go, we got going on. But um, it's, prayer is so important. So next week, we're gonna, we're gonna dive into the Lord's prayer. And you might hear some stuff you haven't heard before, but it's, it's, it's what Jesus gave us in that prayer is crucial for us to understand. And so we're going to really dive into that and it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Okay, so Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for everyone here. Lord, we thank you that you said that you would teach us how to pray. And Father, we humble ourselves before you and we confess that we don't know how to pray, but by your spirit, you will teach us. 
And so, Father, I pray that you would bless each and every one in this room. I pray that there would not be, um, that was one of the things that, 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 that often comes in prayer sometimes. We get sleepy, we get tired, and we just get bleh. That's a spiritual thing we need to be aware of. Father, would you help us to be aware of the enemy that comes in very subtle ways, very subtle ways. Would you help us to be awake in the spirit that when we go to pray, Lord, we, we would not let the things of the world distract us. God, I pray that you would cause us to learn how to just commune with you and how to bear our hearts before you, how to be real and authentic with you and how to just reveal our heart before you, Lord, and invite you into our process and into our pain and into our joy that we'd invite you into everything. So Father, I just pray your blessing over everyone today. I thank you that you teach us how to pray. Lord, that you put prayers on our hearts for our city, for our nation, for our church, for our family, for our friends, and yes, for ourselves. Jesus, I thank you that you show us how to do these things and more. Lord, we call on your name and we thank you that you are all that is awesome. Father, I pray a blessing over all your people today. Lord, that they would look nothing like the world and everything like you. God, I pray that they would be filled with your spirit. I pray that they'd be abounding in love and joy in the fruit of your spirit as they abide in you and that they would indeed abide in you. Lord, as Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday comes, would they lift up their eyes and behold you, Lord, and in your heart, so that they would just open up themselves to you, Father. They would experience you this week, that they would hear your voice this week, that they'd be led by your spirit and that they would be the ones who bring change to their different spheres of influence rather than being changed by them. And so, Father, thank you that you have anointed them to do all that you've called them to do as they go out into the world. Help us to be beautiful representatives of you, Jesus. And I thank you that you give us the grace and the strength to do it as we do it alongside with you. So, Father, thank you. Bless everyone in this house, and I pray you just fill them with lightheartedness and joy and encouragement as they go out this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Good, good. All right, guys, have a beautiful, wonderful week. We'll see you next week.